one volatile compound, for example, I can't remember how to pronounce it, um, can express itself either as cherry or almond. Mm -hmm. um, and so this volatile compound can be found common in coffee. You and I are tasting this coffee. Uh, you taste cherry, I taste almond. And, you know, under the current conceptions of taste, one of us is wrong. But we're both right. Mm. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Ford Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar. This is episode two of our five-part series with Costa. Costa, we are talking about tasting coffee. And today, this is one of my most favorite questions to or conversations to have with coffee professionals who wax poetic to me about, you know, being coming a Q grader and uh, I'm going to tell everybody what coffee tastes like and what it should taste like and what it shouldn't taste like. And this is the right way to taste everything and this is the wrong way to taste everything and this is a defect and today we're talking about is taste objective in coffee so I want you to start by helping people who are not familiar with the term objective what the difference between what objective is and then yeah. what the opposite of, of objective is and then we're going to we're going to apply that to coffee yeah, you know, um, it's it's a good question. I think I would probably, you know, position it this way. That would, which is like considered objective, would probably be that which is considered reality. And how do we determine reality? And I think within specialty coffee, um, in uh, sensory science, but science in general, and then also, you know, just within the West, we consider reality probably to be what's measurable. Um, okay. Is that is that good or fair? Yeah, like like yeah. just just to help people who are probably either struggle with English or are unfamiliar with these terms, uh, because this podcast goes out all over the world. Yeah, and I would just add to that that when something is objective, it's usually measurable. And it's usually got parameters and boundaries around it that are, are testable. So that when you say that this is a pen, you can define that this is a pen and it can't be questioned. However, saying it's a pen is not completely accurate. This is a digital pen, which is, we can all agree, it's a digital pen and, and it, it's an objective approach to that. So I want, I just want people to understand that that's something that we can all agree on because it's measurable. Go ahead. Yeah. And so that's what I think we're reaching with objectivity, mm -hmm. you know, is I think it's a bit of a form of consensus making. Um, and then, you know, the, the other side of the coin, you know, it would be subjective, which I think is kind of this idea of like an interpersonal experience mm. you know what does what does this thing mean to you um you know and the subjective experience is um you know all of your your values your emotions you know your your cultural background and upbringing you know uh, how old you are where you were born all of these things you know that would almost like mm -hmm. be considered like what makes us human mm. um you know like that's that. Yeah, yeah. And so to me, you know, I think that's probably how I would end up defining subjectivity. Right. And so they're at yeah. the two different spectrums of like one's basically to to oversimplify it, one would be fact and one would be opinion. Yeah, I think Deep that's how oversimplification. It's like, sure, sure, sure. You know, and I think that's how culturally speaking, how we probably understand it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um and so like when it comes to like taste and objectivity, do you want me to go ahead and jump yeah, into this? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah, I think we're dealing with a very specific kind of uh, cultural conception. You know, mm -hmm. even the objective subjective binary, you know, has cultural roots, you know, in the West um, and within America, you know, um, it takes on a specific kind of, of flavor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but how do you, how do you determine what's real and what isn't real? You know, what, for example, in, let's just say indigenous cultures in Brazil or Australia, you know, how would they end up describing something? Um, and even like the idea of, for example, the lab, 
which is typically used um, in order to go ahead and um, define and measure objectivity mm -hmm. has its own, you know, cultural roots, which is found, um, oh my gosh, uh, what is it called? Um, the lab was basically designed, I believe Bruno Latour, who's a social scientist, uh, described it as like the iron lung, which mm -hmm. is basically, you know, um, this idea that it's completely absent or devoid of an environment. But when you mm -hmm. take something and then put it in in another place, which is completely absent and devoid in, of its environment, you're going to get like different reactions or understanding of that thing. Um, right. So if you put, if you yeah. examine something in a vacuum, mm -hmm. it's going to, the idea is that you are examining just the thing because it yeah. has no environment and yeah. that will give you and a supposed more mm -hmm. accurate understanding of the thing itself rather than the way it engages with its environment and how its environment influence yeah it. yeah and i think you know from talking with sensory scientists reading papers on the history of like um sensory science in general um talking with professors um you know it seems like the idea that taste um or that idea that taste like the thing that you're tasting that's where it is like the inherent thing like what taste is mm -hmm. you know you just have to understand its biology um it seems to be, you know, incorrect. Um, the way that I understand it now, you know, in the example that I give is taking a volatile compound, mm -hmm. um, you know. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Mapper Forward's first on-demand workshop, How to Become a Coffee Consultant, available now online for you to learn at your own pace with a certificate available upon completion. Click the link in the show notes to access today for just 50 euros one volatile compound, for example, I can't remember how to pronounce it, um, can express itself either as cherry or almond. Mm -hmm. um, and so this volatile compound can be found common in coffee. You and I are tasting this coffee. Uh, you taste cherry, I taste almond. And, you know, under the current conceptions of taste, one of us is wrong, but we're both right. Mm -hmm. So at so there, I think we have, you know, an issue. How, how do we, it, and it's, it's an issue of, you know, I, I almost want to posit it this way, this idea of like a true sensory science and then the commercial aspect, you know, mm -hmm. the true sensory science, the true sensory science, you know, is like this thing is its actual volatile compound. It has the ability to, to express itself as cherry or as almond. We're both right. End of discussion at that point. And you know, the way that sensory scientists try to deal with that type of difference is they end up appealing to some kind of standard. Um, mm -hmm. World Coffee Research ended up developing the sensory lexicon in order to attempt to mitigate the issue of, you know, people tasting the or smelling the same volatile compounds and coming to two different reactions. And then this is a way to go and like bridge the gap and create consensus. Mm -hmm. Within a commercial aspect of like buying and selling green coffee, this has deep, deep, deep ramifications, especially if you're selling based off of taste. And what I see from, you know, over eight years of experience is typically one group of people is right and the other group of people is wrong. And those in the global north who end up defining what taste is or how something tastes tend to be right and those in the global south tend to be wrong. I have almost, I can't think of a single moment in my life in which I saw a buyer cupping with a producer, um, taste a coffee, the buyer describes it as X, the producer describes it as Y, the buyer scores it an 84, the producer scores it an 86, and the buyer says, oh, I'm wrong, you know, I need to go ahead and adjust my score closer to the producer. It's always the other way around. And to me, you know, this, this idea that like taste is like deeply personal and cultural um, and we're basing or assigning financial value on it um, can have the opportunity to be like deeply problematic and basically exacerbate like existing power inequalities between those who end up buying coffee and those who are looking to sell it on the market. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there because you look at the dynamic and what's going on in just simply that exchange between a buyer and a producer, it becomes really, really complicated when we start assigning um, 
a financial allocation, well, first of all, we assign a cup score, which is separate from whether it's got cherry or almond in it, right? And then we look at that even deeper because to that cup score is associated a financial value. And then behind that association of financial value, you have an agenda. So it's the agenda of the buyer needs to pay, wants to pay less for that coffee because he's been given targets, which are the agenda behind the financial value. And then the lower that he can give that cup score, not that it's necessarily actually indicative of what he or she thinks of that cup score or of that coffee, right? But there's so many dynamics at play here that for us to just turn around and say that there's a power struggle going on here based on taste, I'm not sure that we're being fair to or or it is fair to the complexity of all of the things that are happening in that one moment. That doesn't mitigate, though, the fact that we say that these things are true as though they're absolute. And in the position of something being objective, it is true because it is absolute. That's the point of objectivity, right? And we seem in this industry to have these um, ideas of or oh, not ideas, these exchanges that end up being power struggles, as you were saying, um, that end up having real world, real, real world ramifications that end up causing conflict. Like they start as something that is quite benign and then they, they have this tiny little power struggle that's associated with them and then that has ripple effects. And now here we are in an industry that's trying to understand the basis of taste, assign a a cup score to it, which gets assigned a financial value to it, which is unequal. Or it's not that it's unequal. It's something we can't agree on because we don't understand the agenda of the other person. And we can't work off the presumption that we all care enough about each other to do good business and to be legitimate with each other, and to just let's conspire to each other's success. We cannot have that preface in this industry. Yeah, yeah. And it's, to me, it's, it's, what is the word I'm looking for? Maybe um, unintentionally reinforced by using a bureaucratic tool, you know, which Mm -hmm. is the cupping form itself. Um, You know, it's an attempt to strip away, in my opinion, all the social relations, the connections or the disconnections that we have with one another. And to view ourselves and each other with a sense of suspicion that we can't be trusted. And maybe what makes it a little ironic to me um, mm-hmm. is that those, you know, a bureaucratic technology is it, it's supposed to be impartial. Um, you know, and yeah. it, certainly bureaucratic technologies can end up um, benefiting certain parties versus other parties. Um, But that tends to happen when those that have power and control are the ones that end up controlling the bureaucratic technology in the first place, you know? And I think that the most challenging part about this is, is the acceptance that taste is not objective. Because if we have to accept that, we have to accept that the protocols that we use are the best that we can, that we've got right now. They're not an absolute. But the fair part of that argument is, is we need a tool. We mm. need a standard. Yeah. We, we need something that we can all use to have a common language that we're using to try and understand things. And we're stuck because we refuse to accept in this industry the supposition that taste is not objective. And we, we say if we can get a group of people to agree that this tastes like blueberry, that's absolutely true that this tastes like blueberry. But if you look at the nuance of that, how many of the people that are in that group that are calibrating with each other have a high register in agreeableness? Yeah. Yeah. Immediately that nullifies the results, but we don't ask those questions. Yeah. You then take that 
and superimpose that over barista competitions? How many of the people that are in those judging panels, despite the fact being told that they have to be objective, how many of them are intimidated by the people that are competing or have an affection for the people that are competing? All of that impacts your taste receptors, yeah. all of it. Right. And we can't, we can't, you know, we can't divorce, in my opinion, our social relations with one no. another. We can try to hide it, you know, or put it aside, but like we like people, we don't like people, we feel indifferent towards people. Like it's, right. it's just part of like the human experience. And, you know, I can imagine different ways in which we could attempt to use this tool uh, in order to relate with each other in a more harm, like harmonious way, in a more collaborative way and mm -hmm. building consensus. But at the moment, the way that we treat this tool is suspicion towards you and you have suspicion towards me. Um, even if we're not like, it's not the feeling of like, I need to watch out for you. It's more of like, Does we have to watch out for doing? ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This person is doing this, or, you know, I have to, I have to hold a degree of su suspicion because this person has a, you know, a subjective experience. Mm -hmm. And so we come at it in silence, um, and then end up trying to uh, like basically duke it out at the end of each cupping on who's right and who's wrong. And you're told all the time you know, defend your cupping scores. It, like even in the language itself, mm -hmm. you have this sense of, I have to be on the defensive. I have to define and, you know, protect my personal experience. And someone, you know, could bulldoze you. If well, that's you a power struggle. A that's a power struggle. And, and this is where, this is where we start getting to the heart of when you, you can't define anything as objective if you can have an opinion around it. If people can can disagree on it, it's not a, an, an objective approach. It's by definition, it's well into the subjective territory. If you have to defend your position on something like that, mm -hmm. it's not objective. And this is my, all these power struggles have a financial ramification to them, which is what we're going to talk about in the next episode. So join us for that, folks. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks, friends. If you enjoyed this video, here's what you should check out next. Consider supporting Mapper Forward on Patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave.